and hello everyone and welcome to Creative Commons panel from access to culture to contemporary creativity. Um, my name is Bridget Vizna and I'm the director of policy, open culture and glam at Creative Commons. And I'm really thrilled to host this panel. Uh, it's organized within the framework of the UNESCO Brazilian Mondia Cult Initiative. That's a series of global events that are aimed at informing the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. And Mondia Cult 2022 will take place in Mexico next September. Mondia Cult aims to foster a renewed reflection on cultural policies to tackle global challenges and outline immediate and future priorities in order to shape a more robust and resilient cultural sector. And that's why Creative Commons is pleased to participate in this reflection and celebrate better sharing of culture and support for a generative and resilient creative cycle. It's become a trite observation, sadly, that COVID-19 has really magnified how vulnerable the cultural sector is and how much resilience it must build in order to attain the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So over the next hour and a half, I have the pleasure to moderate a discussion that brings together artists, um, creators, and curators who will share their experiences, their knowledge, and their vision on how open access and better sharing of knowledge and cultural heritage are essential ingredients for a vibrant cultural life and resilient and thriving societies. We'll look into the power of licensing and Creative Commons infrastructure as a catalyst for the dissemination and revitalization of culture and its role as an engine for sustainable cultural development, notably through the lens of fair remuneration and the potential for open business models. Um, unfortunately, uh, some panelists are unable to join us at this stage. Um, Elena cannot join us at this time for a last minute hold up and we're still hoping that Jessica will be able to join us. But allow me now to introduce our panelists uh, that are here with us today, Hessel, Ivan and Eddie. And let me start with Ivan Martinez. Uh, he's a free knowledge activist, artist and a human rights defender at R3D, uh, Red and Defensa de los Derechos Digitales. Uh, he was uh, Mexico, uh, sorry, Wikimedia Mexico's chapter president from 2012 to 2018. He was a Wikipedian in residence at the Museo Soumaya, and he's a Creative Commons advocate for digitization and content donation under free licenses. It's a great honor to have you with us, Ivan. Ivan. And now, uh, uh, Eddie. <laughs> uh, Eddie Gray, he's a multifaceted composer, arranger, songwriter and sound designer with a very successful track record. You'll tell us more about this in a bit, Eddie. Uh, Eddie is based in Los Angeles. Uh, he began playing with synthesizers and writing on computer programs at an early age, eventually becoming a musical, uh, beginning, sorry, a musical education that would take him into the world of composing and songwriting. So glad to have you with us, Eddie. Um, and finally, moving to Hessel van Orschot. Uh, he's an experienced entrepreneur with a background in online business models, digital media, and building teams to execute disruptive ideas. Um, Hessel, Hessel is the founder and, air quote, uh, chief of noise at online music business Tribe of Noise, including Free Music Archive. He's a chairman of the board at Open Netherlands, supporting Creative Commons Netherlands, and a chairman of the supervisory board at Thunderboom Records. So welcome to our three panelists that are here with us today. It's an honor to have you on this panel. I'm personally very much looking forward to hearing about your experiences. Um, I guess we will uh, start with, uh, with the questions, um, even though uh, Jessica seems to be unable to join us at this point. But um, let me say that our conversation will be centered around four questions, uh, which all of our panelists will be invited to answer. And we'll make sure to leave space for discussion with participants at the end of our time together. So 
please hold on to your questions uh, until the end or type them in the chat and we'll try to answer them after the panel presentations, panel discussions. Um, so for the sake of time, I, I suggest we get right into it. And Ivan, perhaps I could start with you. Could you start us off and tell us about what better sharing of culture means to you and how does it map onto your experience? Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Brigitte, and thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. So, well, well, while in an era like today, there are, I think, multiple answers to that questions from several angles and disciplines. What I will respond to, pro pro to problematize is that the digital era and the forms of creation are so diverse and in such different ways as they are happening today. Uh, I think in, in the contemporary culture creation, uh, I think that there are many enriching and inspiring ways to share in culture. Uh, and that there is not only a way to share, and the culture has multiple ways to be created and shared, doing in a better way inevitably has to involve uh, analyzing possible models beyond all rights reserved, I think. The real world, what are happening today, every day in environments, in cultural environments, in educational environments, and, and in artistic environments, of course, uh, we have more tools to create, but also to share and create a specific audiences on many cultural topics. And, lead, and that, that situation leads us to deeply analyze the relevance of alternative models of cultural sharing. I, I think it's extremely important for me to point out that it, this is something that is happening and that thousands and thousands of people, of creators, of people that are sharing culture every day uh, are doing that without wondering too much about the specific issues behind it. If we look for an example in YouTube or in TikTok or in Reddit and in many, many places of the internet, uh, may, for an example, if, if we have a tutorial on how to make a reggaeton in a DELW software or a free software musical creation, we will see a person maybe sharing their cultural, their musical cultural better to other people who wants to learn and create and publish and have their work reaching more people, more audiences, without thinking too much about whether what they do conforms to the desired standard of some person of the should be mother. In my case, and, uh, and trying to, to open the debate and foster a discussion, uh, since a decade ago, I'm doing a production of photographies, of an illustration and music in Wikimedia Commons with free licenses as a part of my learning, but also my, sh my sharing part of, of my person. So I think there are no mediation of, of an in economical interest, uh, but it's more important for me the intention of, of, of sharing and understanding the culture and the, on all the, 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 the way of other people creating and learning of other creations. So I, I want to learn if some person are interested in my production uh, about photography, music, and other matters. I, I'm sharing now in, in in the chat my my page at Wikimedia Commons. I, I hope that can be shared and watch it for all the persons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan. Um, Maybe I can follow up with a question to you again, and it's what is contemporary artistic creation in Mexico today and and, and also perhaps in the whole world and and how what what role can open access uh, and using free licenses play? I think uh, for me, the, the most important thing is to emphasize emphasize that the authorial model in my context is something that proposes more than just only selling things. I think there are many persons that are trying to, to share and create uh, um, contemporary art creations more than just only selling things. Uh, just is that trying to watch the, 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 the contemporary creation more 
uh, not just only a transactional matter. It's true that people dedicated to creativity, to art, have the right to fair remuneration for what they produce and create models of profitability to that can produce what they need to live well. But I think uh, uh, in my case and in my context, the cultural creation are, are, are beyond uh, uh, of that because uh, I watch uh, frequently because in in the last months I'm I'm more devoted not only to to free licenses and free creation uh, advisory and activism in such the last years in my life but I'm more devoted in the last months to my own musical career and what what I watch it uh, is that are many people trying to create small audiences, trying to sell merchandising, trying to sell tickets of presentations, more than just only uh, take care about the streaming platforms, for an example. I think the, the contemporary art creation are, are very diverse, have several models of profitability, not just only the, 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 the traditional ways of, of, of sharing the, the producing or the artistical production, I think. Mm, that's fascinating to hear. Um, Hessel, you have experience with uh, sharing music. Uh, why don't you tell us about uh, tribes of, Tribe of Noise and, and what does better, better sharing of culture mean in that context? Well, yeah, let's, I, I can make this like in, into like a big cultural discussion and how important, the, you know, the meaning of culture and to openly share uh, collections. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it like, close to myself. I'm 49 years old now. Um, I have family members of almost 90 years old. I have a, a child of 10. Um, so what you see when you talk about programs that were on television when I was a youngster, or shows, radio shows that, that were on air when, uh, you know, my 90 year old family member was, uh, was young, you see that we already we do share culture. <clears throat> but on the other hand, we uh, she has a completely different history than, than I have. She might have gone to a uh, museum with a collection that is now hidden in a physical building because it's no longer um, uh, fashionable to to share that kind of collection. So it's you know it's it's somewhere there, but we don't share it. And and that's what I hear a lot now with curators of real, you know, musea or, uh, or of people working in libraries. Uh, same thing on, uh, on Tribe of Noise and Free Music Archive is that we have discussions now, like if we digitize and open up and bring it to the world, a lot of people can um, go back into cultural heritage of the old days. Uh, people can remix and reuse, and that's something that Eddie will probably talk about in uh, in uh, in a few minutes. Um, but it also means that we have can have valuable discussions about lessons learned, and um, that we have so much to share that other people can build on, uh, on or upon the, the 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 culture that that's out there. Uh, so that's something that I love, and I, and they're like. Tons of challenges, of course, legal challenges, uh, curators who, you know, maybe in the last 50 years, you know, typed a lot of information with all the collections that they have. But if you read what they were typing, then you might be offended now. So you go, like, oh, man, you know, 50 years ago, you could actually type that next to a painting or next to a statue or whatever that you have in your collection. And nowadays you go like, whoops, that's not politically correct to actually get that, that out. Um, so opening up means taking responsibility, uh, be um, empowered to actually use tooling and to use um, a legal framework to share. And that's also where Creative Commons comes in, of course, because we can ask the curators or the owners or the rights holders or the, the new content creator makers to say, like, is it OK that we actually share your culture? And that can be culture from 20 years ago or maybe something that you inherited from your family but it can also be street culture of today something that is remixed today or tomorrow so i think that's super important to actually have a safe environment where people who curate content and create content and new culture and old culture 
that they have a safe place to actually start sharing it openly on the internet. Um, we try to do our best with in the music scene, um, so with, with Free Music Archive. Um, a lot of questions are asked like, do you keep every file on record? Is everything still there in 10 years time? Like, you know, we, we saw places like SoundCloud and some of the other platforms that were uh, on the urge of, of maybe, you know, were they staying alive or were they going bankrupt or not? And what does happen with, with, with all that repertoire that was created by people that is now part of our culture? Um, those questions should be asked in an, in an open dialogue with as many people as possible. I don't have all the answers. And, and as a group of people here, we, you know, we, we, can, we can give it a try. But I think that that should be a, a goal for us to keep culture alive, share as much as possible. And for the and, and and just for new culture, remix, reuse, revamp, co-create uh, as much as possible. So that's for me. That that's what open culture does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so important. And I love how you emphasize the re in, in all of those verbs. <laughs> and before we get to another re, which is the re rec contest, I would just like to follow up with you because you said something that stayed with me and it's about the responsibility in sharing. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit more what that means and if that's one way to interpret better sharing and what that responsibility entails. Yeah, well, the, the responsibility starts with, you know, we're not talking about the digital society. So, I'm, you know, everything I say, you know, just go like, uh, digital archives, digital uh, uh, openness, uh, um, everything is, is, is online, which already the responsibility starts with the person who um, is the rights holder of, of some form of cultural content, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, we can take away, for example, that, that, that people can now claim stuff online and say it's, it's theirs without um, identifying themselves as being the, the rightful owners of, of the piece of content. They are, they, on the daily base, there are a lot of people who just take a, a photo from somebody else, put it on another website, claim copyright, try to sell it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when we take responsibility, we have to go back to the moment before we actually upload and say, like, if a person uploads this piece of content to the internet, um, is it really bad to ask a specific question, uh, a person, the question like, can you verify that you actually own the rights to uh, to upload or to license or to do that? So that's a bit of responsibility you can uh, give back to the uploader. Uh, same thing, and that's a big discussion in Europe right now with the new uh, copyright directive, is the responsibility of the platform. Like, what as a platform do we do with content that's being uploaded on a daily basis to, to, to our servers, to our web servers? Can we take forms of responsibility? And not just by saying, like, let's uh, create some form of upload filter where we, where we just block everything that we don't trust, because that's, that's too harsh, that's too black and white. Um, but responsibility that if people claim it's theirs afterwards or that if people say like it's safe to use because you know i verified myself and i've done all these things like in, in music industry you can water watermark audio files so you can do like you know give it all kinds of attributes and metadata uh, to give it more trustworthiness um that's that's also a responsibility for the platform and then last but not least i think if you work in a museum, if you work in a library, if you work in a gallery, and if you cu curate large collections of uh, uh, cultural heritage, um, I think you have a responsibility as well to, to double check metadata, to see when you open up that content, if it's still um, you know, okay to do it under the conditions that you did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, what I don't see, happening that much for example is uh, curators of uh, big collections that they that they identify themselves and that they say like we are an authority in in our space uh, and because we are verified and because we are this authority we can we can step up and take a little bit of responsibility for the collection that we now put online for remix purposes or reuse purposes so mm -hmm. those are all these kinds of forms and i haven't even touched uh, uh, you know, governments or lawmakers or whatever. This this is just the stuff that that you and I can do when we mm -hmm. have a piece of content of a piece of, of uh, uh, heritage, cultural heritage, 
physically or, or digitally in our hands. So this is what we can do today ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true that creativity is in the hands of, of every citizen. Um, but there's a lot of creativity in Eddie, I'm sure. Um, I'd love to hear more about your music and your experience in remix and, and sharing openly. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Okay. Eddie Gray from LA. And um, for the last eight years, I've been doing this work uh, full time. I had like a whole life before this, and I always wanted to be in the music field and I always wanted to be like fully self-expressive where I could like take an idea or somebody else's idea and reimagine it. Um, I'm Mexican and I don't know anything about my culture. I don't know, you know, besides just all the popular songs that were in the top, you know, 10 at the time, I, you know, there, there's no history. There's no like a record that I can like particularly like chase after uh, with my particular lineage. And so, you know, being somebody that's in, in music licensing the last eight years, I've basically sold uh, most of the rights of, of, of my music because I want to make a living. And this is obviously a great challenge, this dichotomy of I want to be fully self-expressed and live in the clouds, and be artistic. And also, you know, I have a family. You guys saw my daughter a couple of minutes ago who just went to school. Um, how do I do both of these things? You know, I feel like I almost have two brains, to be honest. And so it's been a challenge to, to, to have to sell my music. It's not like I'm Jay-Z or, or Kanye West who can pay you know, a fee to license a sample from the Everly Brothers or something like that. I can't do that. And so there are some, some restrictions. Um, so in that regard, I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested uh, in a new life, new possibilities. Um, I think you know, clearly COVID has, has uh, magnified a lot of the ways that society is not working. And I think one of them has been in music. Uh, I can, I can tell you, uh, with transparency that, you know, my music life has also changed and, and, you know, how I get our income and, and, and the budgets. And, and so it's, it's been really interesting to, to, to be a part of it and, and to try and help others. That's a big aim of mine as well, but companies like tribe, uh, you know, have assisted and, and supported people like me who are independent. And so I'm super grateful uh, for that. And I'm super grateful to be here as well. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to a new path. I know it's out there. It's just, is it going to happen today, tomorrow, six months or just, you know, six years? So anyway, thank you for having me. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your music, and I, I think that we have something coming up uh, soon, whenever, whenever you, you're ready. Um, perhaps I could already go back to Hessel then, and we can move on to question two. Um, and this is about exactly what you, you just mentioned, Eddie, about um, the, the protection of, uh, of creativity through copyright. Now, I want to challenge us with, uh, with this thought and, and, and say that entry in the public domain marks the end of copyright protection. And similarly, um, releasing creative works into the commons, using creative commons licenses and, and tools frees up those works from uh, all or most copyright restrictions. So, in your opinion, Hessel, how is this a good thing for culture? <laughs> Super big question. <laughs> but um, again, let's try to keep this, this, this you know, close to ourselves. Um, what we've learned with, with when, when we started the, the, the company Tribe of Noise in, in 2008, it actually came from a question from, from uh, videographers. Videographers, a need for music, to uh, synchronize with their video so that they can put it online. And what happens there, of course, is when you do that and you take that song from Jay-Z, as Eddie was just mentioning, you will get a copyright claim or you know, there will be all kinds of people all over you saying like, you can't do that. Um, and if you're not familiar with copyright and copyright issues, then you go like, uh, okay. And it's a bit scary because uh, you know, the letters and the emails that you get are, are uh, aggressive. So um, when we started in 2007, 2008 with creating a, a Tribe of Noise, we were actually looking for a framework where we could reach out to independent musicians and say like, could you allow us to use your music for 
video, for podcast, for small, do- you know, short documentaries or short films, th- those kind of environments where other creators will build upon your work. They, they need your work to actually finish another media file. And uh, luckily, we were already in touch with uh, Creative Commons for, for many years at that stage. And what you learn there, and that's the good thing about Creative Commons, <clears throat> is that every single country does have um, quirky you know, paragraphs about copyright. So, you know, uh, uh, copyright rules in Mexico are different than the ones in in Holland or the ones in the United States, etc. It's not like one global copyright directive that you read and then, then you understand it. The good thing with Creative Commons was it it's a layer on top of what, you know, is, is called copyright, uh, which means that the rights holder can say at that stage, I own the copyright, but I'm more than willing to share this for non-commercial use or to share this even for commercial use if you mention me as the creator, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for us, that framework translated in many languages with all these advocates with creative commons around the world going in case by case to say like, this is how it works in Mexico. Oh, just be aware if, if it's music and it's in Australia, there is this strange law here that, that you know, just be aware of it. Um, that was a big help because we couldn't start a global entity or a global licensing company like Tribe of Noise without the help of all these people knowing in depth what copyright is per country. Uh, going back to the public domain, and this is something that 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 struck me throughout the years now, is that um, if you look like. If, if copyright was something to protect people, uh, uh, you know, that, that I've been researching and developing a product and I just want for the first 10 years to be the only one that can actually uh, uh, license it out and make money to for return on investments, etc. Okay, I get that part. Um, 20 years, still get that part. 70 years after the death of the person who actually created that piece of content, Moi, that that sounds like a ridiculous long time and then in other countries it's even like a hundred years so i never got where, why we why we couldn't go back from 70 years to 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 10 years or to five years or to whatever or or to actually quickly you know make a decision on your own to say like uh like what eddie was saying like i can actually create something sell it make decent cash and move on um i know a lot of people who actually get paid for the process of creating and not for the process afterwards that you can copy and own copyrights and try to resell it again it's more like i needed some piece of content i pay somebody to actually create it and then i have the piece of content and then i can use it again uh but that, you know it doesn't have to be vendor locked in or copyright protected so i think that that's an interesting discussion i have with mm-hmm. with all the stakeholders in this in this field to say like is copyright the best way forward and and do we do we need to keep protecting people 70 years after their death so, so mm-hmm. in that case it's it's it is not it's it's not just a pension but it's mm-hmm. also supporting for your children and your grandchildren and the children of your grandchildren mm-hmm. um yeah that that's yeah. i think where we where we think that uh, creative commons is a is a great global uh, legal framework uh, to actually solve uh, the big gap between public domain and and copyright. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, uh, obviously. And I think the beauty of Creative Commons licenses is their their universality uh, that they apply all over the world and irrespective of uh, the the copyright law at play. So, um, Ivan, why don't you tell us about the situation in Mexico and how yeah, how, how using Creative Commons licenses to free up content is actually a positive thing for culture. I think yes, and uh, in, in spite of having one of the most appalling copyrights law in the world, I think 100 years after the death of the author, and absolutely disproportionate, and I think in my opinion, an unnecessary term, because it's uh, we we as a community we found that the reasons of, of 
putting 80 or 90 or 100 it's it's very uh, borough the discussion behind choosing 100 years because it's not clear what's the reason behind that that random numbers but here in mexico we have 100 years after that of the author i think it's disproportionate and out of out of the of the of, of the purposes that the law is intended to to, to be uh, but I think, uh, for me, as an activist of the free knowledge and the free licenses in, in Mexico, I think here in my country there is a renewed spirit that bets for openness and freedom. Uh, for some years now, I have been part of uh, the trajectory uh, advisory in some relevant projects for culture and education in my country. I know that this panel is intended to, to talk about uh, contemporary art creation, but I want to mention that, uh, as, as previously mentioned, it, there's no black and white in, this, in these environments and this, these matters. Uh, for an example, one of the uh, one of the relevant projects that I mentioned it is the institutional repository of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which is the main university in Mexico. It's public; it's, it's funded with with with, open, with public funds, uh, and one of the main in Latin America. And they have now, by official uh, official agreement, a free Creative Commons license by default, the CC by NC license in all the repository of of, of the U. Uh, I, I want to share here in the chat the link to to the repository uh, and I think it's a great great achievement for the Creative Commons community in Mexico and in Latin America that one of the main universities in this in this in this uh, area of, in this corner of the world is choosing and betting for uh, having for an example hundreds of theses uh, uh, licensed by default with an open, uh, with a creative common licenses secondly uh, it's the mexicana platform uh, it's uh, a platform a digital repository uh, that uh, that is part of the ministry of culture of the federal government of mexico which includes uh, much of the cultural production not only contemporary production but many uh, many items digital items of uh, all the Mexican heritage, cultural heritage that, that it's very broad and I think uh, they are choosing Creative Commons licenses as the fault in, ma in managing a massive and growing adoption of more open and free models of sharing culture to all the people in Mexico where possible and after all uh, with the intention to emphasize the public domain where are possible I think this is very complicated in a country like this with, with that le legal framework. But I think uh, one of the reasons that the, the repository of, of Junam and Mexicana repository, I'm sharing now the the link to to all the people here in, in, in the in the seminary, uh, both institutions that are one of the main institutions in my country, they choose it, the, the Creative Commons licenses because uh, it's one of the, the, the most easy ma uh, ways to remark the intention to share culture with many persons and, the, and to emphasize the, 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 the characteristic of having an open license or free license. Uh, interacting with other repositories that's one of the reasons specifically with UNAM that they choose it a free license so in my context and in my activity that kind of decisions are like a sign of the new times and the and the things to come I think and and that's a situation that makes me very happy of course yeah that's very promising yes I I share the links uh, in the chat for those of you who, who uh, would like to see it uh, the Mexicana uh, repository is a, a real treasure trove of, uh, of Mexican cultural heritage um I'd like to uh, ask you Eddie now how how is uh, the public domain and open uh, licensing of of culture how is that a, a good thing for culture and, and creativity well, I think we could, you know, listen to a song like um, forgetting the I'm blanking on the name, but I everybody knows that uh, Maroon Five. Uh, they just did a song, and it it contains the the motif of of Canon in D by Pac Bell. You guys know the song, da na 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 na. And so that's a really good example of how something could be, you know, reimagined. And um, although they don't necessarily are, they're not, you know, telling everybody that's where we took the the idea. I mean, it's clearly 
taken from the same. Uh, and so obviously no one is going to, uh, you know, cause a, a, a riff about it. But uh, yeah, I think this is important. You know, I could say, you know, for myself that I borrow from myself all the time. And, and uh, I mean, why, why shouldn't you? If, if you made the idea, why, and you sold, the, you know, the song to somebody, uh, Bach did it all the time, you know, when he was, he had like 18 kids. And so he didn't have a lot of time to, to compose. Uh, and so he would get like jobs and he, you know, they would say, Hey, you know, I need you to make a song for the, you know, for the, for the queen by this weekend, it's her birthday. And so he would basically take his own ideas and, you know, change the key, modulate, and then he would come up with memories. Thank you so much in the chat, uh, Maya. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, uh, this, this needs to change. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, how long it's going to take. I think public domain was, was a step in the right direction. Obviously, uh, like Ivan said, a hundred years is just way too long. So um, I'm looking forward to to that day for sure. Yeah, Eddie, 18 kids. That that's got to be hard to to manage, right? And 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 also to feed. I guess we, yeah, we like all creators are are, are probably have a family to feed and have bills to pay. So how do we, you know, reconcile this this idea of, of free content? Um, when we know that a lot of creators are under financial pressure, uh, especially because of the pandemic, as, uh, as you all mentioned. So how can creators um, and artists find resilience uh, and sustainability through open models? What's your take on this? Well, uh, I'm going to quote something from the book because I've been reading the uh, Made with CC book. If you guys uh, are a beginner, a junior in your in your thinking and your experience, I highly recommend it. I don't have a link to it, but it's called Made with Creative Commons. And it says here, uh, you know, we don't make jokes and games to make money. We make money so we can make more jokes and games. And this is from the creators of the Cards Against Humanity. Whether you like the game or not, that's besides the point. And I could say that for musicians and artists, I could tell you with complete sincerity, if you're the real deal and you really live the lifestyle, you're like, in other words, you're not about the fame, you're not about being an Instagram model or whatever. Uh, you know, we, I'm just gonna kind of rephrase that, but we don't make music to make money. We make money so we can make more music. Uh, you know, a lot of the gear in here is, is insanely expensive. And, uh, you know, people will come in here or, or see me through a Zoom and they're like, oh, it's, it's awesome. It's like, well, you don't understand. Like, you guys are going on vacation and you guys are going here and there. I'm spending it on the next compressor on the next. So these things, you know, uh, are, are a major factor and, and, and they do make you better. You know, they, they certainly, uh, they help you uh, in that process. But, um, but how do we alleviate kind of the, the, the idea of, um, of, of making more money? Uh, I think it starts with the, with one step. I mean, I think we've taken that step. Like I said, companies like Tribe, they've supported, you know, people like me and, and plenty of others. And so I think that's one step and, and we're kind of like in, in the space of what is coming next. I hope I can be a part of that. If I'm even a part of the conversation, it'll be an honor. Uh, but, you know, I definitely don't have the answers at this at this juncture. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, and it's true that... Uh... That quote from uh, Made with Creative Commons really resonates not just for comedians, but for uh, all sorts of, of creators that that find joy and find a purpose in, in, in the simple act of creating and do not need uh, monetary rewards. Um, is that your experience, Ivan? Or could you tell us more about how you perceive, uh, yeah, how you reconcile the need to, to earn a living and uh, your, your creative ambitions? Yeah, and to remark my previous answer a bit, I think the conventional copyright model tries to lead us to what seems at times to be a dead end or one way of doing things. Uh, and in today's reality, that can be extremely misleading, I think. A creative person in today's age, and, and, and maybe we can review dozens of videos and seminars and tutorials available for emerging and independent artists are based on the idea of diversif diversifying incomes and creating small audiences. And for an example, selling concert tickets, direct merchandising sales, teaching other persons, among other actions to, to 
to make, to pay the bills of course the expectation of a contemporary artist i think it's not exclusively based on copyright management in, uh, in, in, in in today in fact for thousands of creative people of all kinds not only music in in in, in, in contemporary plastic creations in teaching other persons to to increase their artistic skills the issue of copyright is not even in their expectations personally in the last few months i have dedicated myself to develop my own career as a songwriter and this has given me a more clear picture of how the music industry in my city moves in the case of an average musician musician in mexico city of course streaming is very important but more for the ends of the dissemination or reaching audiences easily but uh, it's very important but not the main the main thing uh, a lot of an average music, musicians income is not centered in the manage of royalty incomes but in many other ways such as concert ticket sales uh, I think the the main learning here is that the form of business diversification can be many and very various in, in, in an epoch like we are living. Yeah, these are these are great examples to hear. Hessel, I wonder if we can follow up on this because you have a lot of musicians working with you at Tribe of Noise. Is that also their experience? How how do they how do they reconcile their their giving away their music for free with uh, with earning a living? <laughs> starts with the reality check <laughs> i think everybody who posts music online knows that it's it, you know that that they're giving it away for free although that they might sign a deal where it says like you can't download or you can't do this or you can't do that when it's on youtube it's it's you know it's free to listen to and with a little plugin it's free to download which is legal but everybody does it so they, there you go so what we what we are saying to most of the folks and this this is something i see on the daily base now on free music archive so freemusicarchive.org there are half a million people every single day downloading two three terabytes of songs uh every single day and all the music there most of the music is uh, licensed under a creative commons license Funny enough, a lot of the people who uploaded music to Free Music Archive in the past, curators, musicians, net labels, people helping them, family members, etc. They, they first of all used a Creative Commons license where it says like, it's okay that you listen to my music, that you stream my music from the platform, or that you download the music, that's okay. Just don't wander off with my music and, and use it in a TikTok movie and become a gazillionaire overnight because then I want to be part of it. So, you know, that part where they can just listen and download that, that's fine for, for personal use, that's fine. So you see a lot of folks doing that, and which is a great first step because two things happen. First of all, you, you will gain an audience, uh, but that, that, that's a message from the last 10 years. Everybody's saying that, like, you know, just be on the internet and you will, you know, we will, we will give you the eyeballs or the, or the listeners. Um, the second thing that happens is that if you have a page like on Free Music Archive or like on Tribe of Noise. And of course, there are other platforms where you share some of your content free with the world. You can add all kinds of information on that page. So you can say in a, in a subsection, you can say like, hey, if you are not just a listener who likes my music, but you're actually a videographer or you're a TikToker or a YouTuber or a podcaster or whatever, did you know that by sending me an email that I will probably be willing for, you know, 50 euros, 100 euros, a few hundred euros to actually give you the right to use that specific song in your uh, in your media asset. And then again, Creative Commons offers these, these standard, you know, uh, uh, there's a CC plus license that you can use. So you can put your own terms in there and say, like, for this specific project, uh, I will license my song for 200 euros. And then, uh, you know, that person is good to go and he, he will get some form of evidence or receipt that he's actually licensed that content. So Creative Commons doesn't mean that you're giving away for free. It's a stepping stone to actually connect with other people in need, <clears throat> sorry, for your music. That's happening on a daily basis. That's also where Tribe of Noise comes in with, with our business model. So we actually say like, start with creative commons, start to learn the audience, start to have those conversations with people who actually like your music, even for commercial purposes. And then those people can actually connect on Tribe of Noise with 
um, Tribe of Noise Pro, which is an online shop where they where where people in need for music can just license songs per track for a project. So that that's that's a great example. And uh, I think what Eddie did with with us and with some of the other participants was actually, and I, I just shared you a link to um, uh, in the chat to um, a re-record project that we did uh, on Tribe of Noise, where we actually we did all the curation to find public domain uh, works, so compositions. And then we asked people like Eddie, like, hey, you know, you, you probably have heard this version in the 50s or in the 60s by some famous artist, uh, but it's new now 20, in this case, 2018. Um, why don't you record your own version of that song and license that song on the uh, a Creative Commons so that people can enjoy your version of that very famous old song from even going back to the 16th century. Uh, we got some amazing feedback and some, you know, amazing uh, participants sending in their versions. Uh, and then the fun part, what we did is we actually pressed them into vinyl uh, and uh, sent a bunch of vinyls to, uh, to all the participants as a big, uh, a big thank you. Um, but that was a great example where actually curated content uh, came, uh, um, uh, yeah, came to use, and 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 where we connected. Oh, there's the vinyl. <laughs> so Eddie has the vinyl there. Great. But yeah, so that, that's that's a great way. And I see this happening with because I saw a question from uh, Christina. Maybe I can like instantly ask the, uh, or respond to her question. Um, she's asking. What could the cultural heritage institutes do to engage a more open position towards different communities? Uh, well, first of all, the, you know, the communities are now online. So if the cultural heritage institute can find a way to actually bring all the cultural heritage to the internet in a safe environment so that people can enjoy, that's already like a big step for a lot of the, the, the institutes. Then the second thing, if, if part of that collection is actually um, ready to be used for remixing and 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 reuse and and to build upon, then you can actually do the other thing. You can invite artists like Eddie, but also painters and photographers and and other you know uh, uh, visual artists to actually dive into those digital collections and handpick. So you know the curators will just pinpoint them to the digital collection, and then the artist will go in and say like ah, this is nice, I see some audio here and I see some video here and I see an image here and I see some, you know, a nice lyrics and text and whatever. And I will create something unique and under the terms of the Cultural Heritage Institute, uh, relaunch and uh, republish that content um, for the world to enjoy. I think that's that's where those two worlds can really, you know, where the, where the creative communities can actually really team up with um, the Cultural Heritage Institutes. In the Netherlands, we have something that's called uh, uh, Sound and Vision, which is one of those institutes. They're running those kind of competitions uh, and, and programs as well, where together with uh, Nui Institute and other institutes, they're actually inviting artists to dive into those archives and uh, you know, find those, you know, just find those, those pieces that, that they would love to, to build upon and uh, be inspired by and, and come up with new work. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's where those two worlds uh, meet. Mm -hmm. oh, that's beautiful to hear. And we, one can only imagine all the possibilities when uh, when digging into the archives, what what we can find in order to create something new. That's, uh, that's truly inspiring. Um, I wonder if you have any more thoughts on this or if we can move to the final question. Um, if that's okay with you, which is more of a policy question. So we've discussed a little bit copyright law and uh, I've heard a few comments in, in that respect, but I wonder more holistically, what do you think are the, the key policy gaps uh, in, in cultural policies and how we can develop policies that would bridge uh, those gaps between open culture and contemporary creativity, especially in the digital world where so much of our copyright laws uh, have, have failed to keep up with, with the new technologies. So 
Um, Ivan, what are your thoughts on, on this question? And what, what advice could you give us about um, reforming policies or creating new policies in order to really connect access to cultural heritage and supporting contemporary creativity? Well, uh, I think that uh, in the current legal framework, at least in my country, those who have the strongest voice in the discussions and the developing of policies are the music and book industries, but not other communities that work continu continuously with contemporary creations, such as independent creators, small galleries, small independent labels, which in fact are not exactly benefited by the current policies, I think. In fact, uh, I have been personally interested in documenting the processes and the effects of current policies in non-industry environments, and I continually find that examples of people who are far from feeling benefited by all, all right to serve uh, work with free licensing models without that they are doing so. <laughs> I think that the policies will necessarily move and have to be made with a much needed discussion between the copyright of courts, but other rights such as the right of to culture and the right to education. And this is especially important in a country like mine who have deepest uh, and uh, concerning gaps of access to culture, uh, especially with people who, who doesn't have any uh, way to access to culture uh, and with several gaps uh, around socioeconomical factors, I think, uh, uh, with the inequities and different uh, gaps uh, in education and culture. So I think uh, these policies will, will need to be holistic, but with consideration that are completely outside and not just only the influence of the, of the current industries that are unfortunately uh, having a strongest influence in this in this in this the, in the development of, of mm -hmm. policies yeah yeah and uh, yeah i fully agree with you it really emphasizes the importance of uh, multi-stakeholder dialogues and making sure that all the concerns of all parts of society are being heard and are being uh, invited to contribute to the development of these policies um, Eddie, I wonder if you have any ideas, maybe from, from your own personal perspective, what would be most helpful for, for contemporary creators uh, in terms of policy? What, uh, what's, what frameworks, what systems should be in place to allow someone like you to create based on uh, what's already out there? Well, if you don't mind, I'll actually share just to kind of change up the dynamic here. So I'm going um, to show you the, uh, the remix that I worked on uh, when Tribe was hosting their, their contest. Now, something that I should say is that I've never remixed a song. So not only was this really fun, and it made me feel like a 13 year old again, but it was also uh, quite the education. And so if I hadn't partaken in this, there would be like a great missing in, in my life and also the, the, the musical kind of knowledge that I, you know, that I contain within myself, which uh, I'll humbly say is not much. I'm always trying to learn every single day. Um, but yeah, this is how we learn. And, and if we want to raise up, you know, the next set of Mozarts and, you know, Rachmaninoff and all, all the greats, uh, I, we have to start sharing this a bit more, you know, freely. Um, let me play and then I'll talk to you about something else. So this is where the song started. This is a, an original that I found. Uh, so I'll just let you take, you know, 10 seconds and if you could just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it here we go okay so when i play that it conjures up images for everybody in their own unique way maybe you saw a movie maybe you traveled to a certain country um and so I, you know i took that idea and i thought well you know we're living in this century now and why don't we modernize it and, I, and i'm not a hip-hop guy I'm, I'm not trained uh, in any field i'm like a musical chameleon so i took that and i um and i made it slow and so it, it, i pitched it down and it sounds like this now so by taking this original version a slowed down version that i had to you know 
uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you the session now, but maybe I could do something outside of this um, where I kind of go through the, the, the detailed work of sampling. And then I found a, uh, a secondary version that sounds like this. Uh, it should be coming on. So anyhow, by mixing all these three versions, um, uh, placing them in half time, sampling them through a sampler, doing all sorts of wizardry, uh, this is the remix that I came up with. Okay, and you can go to try for noise if you want to hear the rest of it. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know that that moment in time, uh, you know, on a personal level, I would have missed out on to me what I consider to be heaven. You know, it's it's a, such a beautiful experience to touch that magic. Um, I'll never get to do it again in that way. But I, when I listen to it, you know, it, it brings up those same memories, uh, but in a different way. And now, hope you know, hopefully, this can become. Uh, you know, a new moment for a 13 year old out there, uh, you know, music is very healing and it touches people in different ways at different times in their life. And so uh, you can see the value here. I, I didn't create the original piece, but I certainly uh, took something and, and completely reinterpreted it. And it can it can certainly be considered original in, in its own right. Uh, but that's one idea. And uh, I'll just play you, you know, another idea. So this is Rachmaninoff remix. I think this is public domain from my understanding, but but, you know, even then you can kind of hear, OK, he's taking an existing idea uh, and, and making a difference. So here's this one. stuff there so yeah the you know these these songs this art has a life uh and it needs to it needs to come out it needs to blossom somewhere and so you know i'm excited i want to create a bunch of remix albums uh, on box songs and mozart songs but i also want to make sure that i'm monetized fairly for these efforts and so i'm trying to find kind of uh you know uh something that makes sense that's that's reciprocal in nature but anyway Oh, this is music to my ears in the literal sense <laughs> and in the figurative sense. Um, it's it's wonderful. I th I'm pretty sure that participants fully enjoyed this little musical interlude. It's uh, it's very inspiring to to hear how from something that already exists out there, something completely different can can come up. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear about your inspiration process. Can you share a little bit what? what parts of yourself did you add on to this and and how much of this uh represents your yourself and your own expression um your creative expression yeah well again i'm so i'm not a hip-hop guy like i don't go around and you know i don't know smoke a bunch of like ganja and uh that, that that's not what i do uh, but but i love music you know i really i truly live for it i you know a lot of people they they say they want to do this but like i've made every sacrifice to kind of ensure that i can i can really live the lifestyle um, and so, you know, when I, anything that you start to touch, uh, it, it starts to have your imprint on it. So, so it's inevitably going to sound something like you, like I could never make the music that Hessel or Ivan makes, uh, you know, I could never write like them. I could never look like them. And it, this is part of the, 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 the process of like inspiration that, that we look at each other and we go, Oh, that's interesting. How did he, you know, come up with that? So when I was looking at the original uh, um, song for for the remix, you know, it's it's babbling to me because I didn't, you know, I'm not studied again. I I, I didn't go to, to to school for this, so I don't understand 
uh, harmony or theory the way that they did. But in listening to it and, and in taking the stems and taking them apart, you know, it's an education. Now, imagine if I had the original files. Imagine if I had the original stems and the cello and, you know, the brass. I could, I could become a better musician. I'm currently studying the Beatles right now, and I have a book for it, you know, that, that transcribes. But even those books have errors, and they're not catching all the subtleties where, you know, where intervals are, are harmonious or, or, or disharmonious. And so, like, if we, if we gave these stems and, and this information to the next generation, you know, five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15, 20, uh, man, I just feel like it would, it would make music better uh to listen to like in the grand scheme of things now of course there's like this whole other conversation and there's greed and, and politics involved but i think the upside is, is certainly stronger and so uh, you know i want to make a case for it well uh, you're an inspiration to to many musicians out there i'm sure um hessel what, what are what are your views on perhaps the the policy situation now what gaps there might be and how we might be able to fill those gaps I, th I think what Eddie just described and um, uh, Ivan is, is we need a um, level playing field where uh, the content creator is as part of a stakeholder as, you know, a big um, organization representing the copyrights in a nation, etc. So when uh, when I read things like uh, in, in, in law, it says everybody is entitled to a fair remuneration, um, then Eddie will probably not like, of course, yeah, you know, I, I, I work hard and, you know, and, and uh, I have to pay rent. And so I need somebody to pay for the bills. And if I make music and sell it, then that's fair. In other cases, fair remuneration might be uh, a lot of traffic to your website or um, giving away some music, but in return, get like a full stadium for concerts or, you know, so fair remuneration doesn't mean it has to be somebody with a bag of money saying like, okay, this is fair. Here's a hundred euros. Uh, and, and, you know, it can, can be something totally different. Uh, that's what lacking now in a lot of the, uh, in, in the political discussion in general, but also a lot of in the, in the policy papers that I read is that everybody goes back to a certain like, yeah, we represent performing artists for, um, you know, we will collect money for them because it says fair remuneration, which is money. Therefore, there needs to be an institute. Um, and then we end up with silly situations in some countries like here in the Netherlands, where an, an, an institute can say like, even if Eddie doesn't want to, we will collect on his behalf anyway. Because you know, we, we think he should be fair remunerated in money. And then maybe Eddie at that certain stage for a specific song has a completely different idea what he wants to do with that song. But then there is an organization just uh blocking his way of success because they, you know, they they go on a on a higher level into into the policy discussion and say, like, no, 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 there needs to be fair remuneration, there needs to be cash. So I think fair playing field. Uh, or level playing field where where the musician, the content creator is a is a stakeholder in the discussion. Um, that's something that that I will probably keep fighting for. That that's super important. Um, and then of course, go from business case to business case. And if you see that in it's written in law that in general those are the terms. Give individual artists because they are creators. Give them some form of freedom to experiment in different directions because otherwise everybody will do the same thing like what they did 20 years ago and then we still have in, in dutch law it still says uh, things like we have to fight uh, cassette piracy and go like who still you know who still records stuff on the cassette that's you know that's outdated come on stop doing that so we have to move forward give creative enough space enough tooling and and also enough trust to actually do their thing that they're best and that's you know create our future create our culture and and and, and build upon so uh, that that's what i would love to throw into the discussion is like make content creators stakeholders in um, in future discussions about copyright and culture and reuse of culture Mm -hmm. What a what a beautiful message! Uh, I think it's uh, 
it's really important to make sure that everyone is invited at the table. And um, oh, I see that Jessica has just uh, joined us. Hi, Jessica. Nice to see you. Fantastic. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. We are just about to uh, close the panel discussion, but this is actually a very good time for you to be joining. Um, I was um, just speaking with Hessel, Ivan, and Eddie about uh, all, all the questions that uh, that that we need to find answers to in order to to understand the the role of access to culture to to sustain. Um, uh, contemporary creativity. So given that we only have about 20 minutes and I still want to uh, leave a bit of time for questions, I would invite you, uh, Jessica, now to uh, to share with us uh, your, your project, your experience. And um, I, I would just give you the floor for about 10 minutes uh, for you to, to, to talk to us about all the interesting things you do for sustainable fashion and for open and, and free knowledge sharing. So. Um, if you if you want to take it from here, I would I would love to to uh, invite you to make your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, just make a, a a crazy situation about the Argentina and and sorry, but um, in 2014 I create Biorico. It is a sustainable brand. Uh, we um, training uh, people with disability, uh, especially in intellectual disability, uh, using a technique uh, of the do-it-yourself movement uh, and uh, upcycling urban plastic waste. Uh, at the same time, we, we do that and uh, we spend two years training, but uh, we do that to empower these people um we with these uh, skills uh, and knowledge uh, because uh, we are in this moment we are uh, the expectative the these people just creating their own sustainable project and this year we just noticed that um, these people uh, are start to create some a home staff about this, this recycled material. So um, this is uh, just prove the if you train in some, someone, uh, then these people you you can give the 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 tools, and of course uh, it's about the the found the found the yeah the the, the founding to to pay our bills. Uh, we create this uh, platform Biotico. Uh, we are selling bags, but uh, using the, the free knowledge and using this uh, free cultural uh, approach. And then these people just create uh, their own project. So it's, it's, maybe it's, it's not everything is a free license, but uh you can use uh this training or, or this uh shared thinking but then uh, these these people just can create new stuff not using uh, create your same stuff that you sell but different stuff uh, with this technique to uh, make uh i i think this make um, uh, a so society more, uh, more collective and and, and more uh, creative, and and then um, the last year, uh, I create a, I'm the a fashion a, I'm I'm working in fashion revolution. I I was the coordinator of fashion revolution Argentina. And we create the Fashion Revolution Encyclopedia in Apropedia. It is an um, open encyclopedia. And we uh, developed this year two maps, interactive map, that, that we um, invite all the Latin American uh, creators to uh, use the tool. First, uh, we create a maps to the second hand stores 
and then you find a lot of secondhand stores uh, to promote the circular fashion uh, in all the Latin America. And then uh, we create um, maps from repair, uh, repair clothes. Uh, so these projects are super, um, yes, get a lot of engagement and the people just can use the encyclopedia uh, with super differ, difficult for uh, fashion creators to involve in this kind of uh, platform, but they do that. So I, I, I really think the, the hope to, to can share this kind of project. And this year we are uh, developing uh, the Wikimedia, uh, a project in Wikimedia from the sustainable fashion and, and even for the Fashion Revolution Week in April, we are um, make the editathon from a fashion transparency, transparency in fashion. And, and, and we feel that uh, it's cool because all the audience, all the collaborators of Wikipedia that think that fashion is just, the thing that happened in runways, uh, that is not, it's, it's about uh, law, uh, about the, the worker law, the, the human rights law, and even the, the environmental. Uh, in, in, and I mean, it's about, about law, because uh, if the government's not, uh, get uh, influence in, in this in this uh, or take position of what about making fashion to the people or to the environment uh, i think that we will not see uh, a change a direct change for the fashion brands uh, so okay i'm an activist but i use uh, yes creative common license in all everything that I do in the projects. And of course, uh, some projects are volunteers, but other you can find funds. If you get a cool idea, there is a lot of institution that give you found for practice your or making your project. So I think this is my way of life using a Creative Commons li li license and and I, I can pay my bills. <laughs> Thanks so much. I mean, in my excitement of, of seeing you join us, I, I forgot to introduce you to the participants. So um, I just take this opportunity to say a few words uh, about you. And then, of course, we can follow up with, the, with a few questions. But I wanted to say that uh, you were born in, um, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in one of the districts with um, one of the most controversial textile fairs of the textile industry in the country. Um, and that prompted you to study clothing design and to reflect on the impact of textile production. Um, and you're really interested in sustainability and transparency uh, in the textile and fashion sector. And that's why you founded your, your, your label, Biotico, uh, which is an ethical uh, fashion label that is committed to generating a, a positive impact on society. And I, I find that uh, extremely inspiring in the context of our conversation because um, these are the the key themes that I think have permeated the conversation is about sustainability, uh, about ethics, and making sure that um, the creativity is has a positive uh, impact on society. So um, I wanted to underscore this. Um, I'm also very uh, excited about your project on Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Sustainable Fashion, because uh, by sharing uh, free and open knowledge about uh, about fashion on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia, sorry, you can really strengthen the bond uh, between uh, fashion and the Wikipedia community, and that is a way for you to try to achieve the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Can you explain a little bit more 
how you aim to achieve those goals through um, the sharing uh, freely and openly of knowledge and how uh, your sustainable um, approach to, to fashion is also a way to contribute to uh, a, a new uh, way to envisage contemporary creativity. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I think the link fashion with open license or even uh, be volunteer and editing Wikipedia is, is difficult. Uh, for this reason, uh, I got a lot of work uh, and, and the team uh, of Fashion Revolution Argentina, we got a lot of work to introduce uh, the, the community of fashion and even the sustainable fashion in um, this open li li license because uh, the people in fashion really think in profit, but, um, and even the activists don't feel the Wikipedia like a, a platform to express uh, her activism. But uh, I just, first, I, I just focus in the importance of women that are, um, start to editing Wikipedia because uh, the, the women maybe uh, don't think they got uh, so much um, things to, to say or even they, they don't, want to feel that they can to uh, make some mistakes. Some, uh, so this is a lot of work of, of motivate, motivated. And we focus first in women because uh, our, our, our audience in Fashion Revolution is our 19, 14% women. So we focus in, in, in this and then um, we, we try to uh, connect the technology uh, and uh, even the editing uh, knowledge in, in women because for, for us it is uh, really important. Uh, and, and even to, uh, with data, show uh, what is important is collaborate in, in Wikipedia and most of them, the articles in, about fashion, uh, some of them are, are really in, incomplete. It's, it's a lot of, it's, it's terrible when you just, I don't know, uh, write leather, don't have any environmental uh, section uh, or even uh, a fashion brands. Uh, there's, I don't know <laughs> where, where you can find a fashion, fast fashion brand in, in Wikipedia, but you find that. And there is not a, a section of controversial, controversial section. So we focus in this and we think that uh, if we just can uh, make this uh, edit, edit to complete this, see lost parts, and we just um, collaborate with the knowledge uh, about sustainable fashion and about all the problems that we have today with fashion. And we, we think that the, for, for us, the better is the education uh, and then uh, to give the force to the people just take action and start, start to asking the, the brand uh, who made their clothes and what's in their clothes. Because uh, more, yes, uh, every time we'll see in our countries, a lot of effect of uh, climate change, but uh, for me and even in Argentina now, there is a lot of uh, fireworks. Um, you you really see that this climate change first are made directly uh, from the action of humans. So I really think that we can just um, reverse and regenerate the, the ecosystem and the communities. Yeah, thank you so much. Again, I think it's a very powerful message and uh, the role of creators in, in sharing knowledge openly to fill knowledge gaps and, and to make sure that um, 
every citizen has access to the complete picture, I think is an important role for, for uh, everyone. But I think artists have probably a special, artists and creators have a special message to share. We are almost at time for our um, panel. I wonder if there are any questions from the audience at this stage. There doesn't seem to be any. Perhaps uh, Hessel, Ivan, or Eddie, you would like to to comment on on Jessica's uh, lightning talk, which uh, was delivered uh, right at the end of our panel. Would you Would you like to comment? Um, any Any one of you? Sure, sure. Thank I, you. I, yeah, I, th I think in the in the fashion on one hand side, you see uh, a lot of people borrowing ideas from other people. So when it comes down to fashion and design. You see all these ideas uh, uh, being shared and also in many cultures being copied <laughs> illegally. Um, uh, but I think by making those processes transparent, and it, you know, it's now in, in for you in the, in the fashion industry, of course, uh, but in other industries, it uh, could also help to actually open up the discussion to actually have lively discussions about this is what we see and this is where we think as a community we should go, um, it will benefit many more. So uh, do you see, Jessica, um, what you're doing in your part of the world? Is, is it copy-paste? Can it be copy-pasted to, to Europe, for example? Do you say like it, it, it's different, different vibes, different way of doing things or? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, maybe of course uh, there is uh, a lot, a lot of things of uh, a lot of uh, kind of, of people. There is got a lot of potential, but I feel the the people just uh, got fear to express their creativity, um, because of course you you can you, you can do a lot of uh, creative things. So uh, for me the. The problem is uh, think in, in 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 the um, in the market. So they like a designer you say, okay, maybe my, my product is doesn't sell, but I guess we have to focus in what about our products uh, or what the what way our products can help the community and help the environment, and we just have to. Um, move our focus of creating and of course that we have to win money but I think that uh, if we just believe in us and believe in our communities and our potential to change uh, the things and of course that we do that and we try to do that and even uh, in Fashion Revolution uh, our audience is uh, most of the sustainable entrepreneur of fashion and these people are really are um, changing and using uh, all the clothes that uh, secondhand clothes that are got in in her her mind and in her hands so they can create brands a little brands uh, super innovative that they they are focused in the local production in a small production and maybe in Latin America, we represent for that because here you can create a brand and you don't have need that just your hands. So in Chile, in Mexico, uh, in Brazil, in all the countries, there are uh, created uh, a lot of brands, if, for example, upcycling uh, and Maybe you can see some similar designs, but I guess the the point is the the motivation to change the um, this the, the, the system. A lot of uh, teenager creators think uh, to change the system, and for me, I'm super sure that these people don't think in the copy paste or don't don't have fear to get copy because these people just uh, born 
with with this uh, internet contemporary moment and when you are on internet um, everything is is got the opportunity to be copied so if you if you feel you lost the fear to be copied i guess you are really uh, free mm -hmm. yeah i love this 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 it's a change of mindset really um we only have one minute left but we got a question in the chat for eddie so if eddie you can take 30 seconds to answer ulrich who's asking um how were you feeling when you started to release using creative commons did you fear coming back to the idea of fear uh, that you gave away control or did it trigger positive feelings look i mean this is going to happen regardless uh like i said it's just a matter of when um the sharing of information you know got started many many years ago look i, I don't consider myself a musical genius like i don't have that kind of ego i'm just a player in the musical game um for any of you that know music, you know, Ulrich, uh, look, uh, there's only a potential, you know, seven notes, 12 notes with semitones in music. Uh, you know, uh, look at uh, past examples. No Woman, No Cry from Bob Marley is the same chord progression as With or Without You from U2, which is the same chord progression as uh, What's My Age Again by Blink-182. So, th so it's supposed to be copied, but you're supposed to put your twist on it. Uh, last thing I'll say is, you know, an artist is that a uh, person that that takes the influences uh that that he's copied and makes his own look at bruno mars he's like a perfect blend of uh, uh um um uh, james brown and you know a couple of other people so so this is supposed to happen don't be afraid you know just open yourself up to the possibilities i've actually received jobs and stuff like this from uh releasing my music uh under cc so good luck and you know stay open stay happy and stay focused on what you want Thank you so much, Eddie. So we've reached the, the end of our panel discussion. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, this has been a very fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot and it was truly inspiring to hear from all of you. Thank you for, for sharing your perspectives on open access and, and how it can really nurture contemporary creativity. It's, uh, it, we, we've seen it in, through so many examples. Um, and also your resilience and how um, your efforts and creation and creating um, really speak to the resilience of the sector. So it seems to me that um, in the wake of UNESCO embracing the value of open, uh, like it like it did through the recommendation on open science and the recommendation on open educational resources, uh, promoting a, a positive policy framework around open access to, to culture and the digital environment, um, is really poised to be the international community's greatest commitment to supporting better access to culture in the 20th, uh, 21st century. Uh, so uh, I'd like to end on this. Uh, thank all the participants uh, for being with us. Thank again, Hessel, Ivan, Eddie, Jessica for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch and um, there will be possibilities to continue this conversation. So please keep an eye on Creative Commons uh, communication channels. Um, hope to hear from all of you again. Thank you so much and have a great, great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you very much.